So we've got a bunch of parts to make and not very much time. I've got four jobs that need to ship on Thursday. Today is Tuesday. Fortunately, one of them is already done. That just needs to be packaged up and shipped. And actually two of them are done. There's another one that's already been shipped. And then I have two here that are waiting to go on the machine. There are 20 very small parts coming out of this piece of three or four. And then I have five parts coming out of this not so small block of aluminum. The 20 parts coming out of this piece of stainless are all the same parts, whereas there are five different designs coming out of the block of aluminum. So we're gonna start with this. I've already done the CAD and CAM work on these parts, but I haven't started on the aluminum parts. So by getting this running on the machine, I can start doing CAD in the background on the aluminum part. As ever, our challenge is going to be work holding, but I have a plan. For the op one on the stainless parts, I'm going to be using this collet fixture. This is the same base plate I made for my three jaw chuck. I just swapped on the collet fixture. Now, unfortunately this bar doesn't go very far down. So I'm going to have to cut it up into a couple pieces. And my plan is to just kind of slowly feed up the material until it becomes too short. Hopefully I don't lose so much that I um, run out of material. The parts are only, they're under a quarter inch tall and this is a foot of material. So 12 inches. Um, but if I lose, you know, an inch to every part because of work holding, then obviously I'm going to run out of material. So hopefully, hopefully this method will work. This part kind of looks like a tiny double-sided crown. There's a cylinder with some features on the top and the features on the bottom, and they need to clock respective to each other. I was originally just going to make some soft jaws on my flux vise to hold them. And maybe that's still what I'll end up doing. But these parts are so small that I'm worried that they will collapse under the pressure of the jaws. So what I'm actually going to do is right there on my jaws, I'm just going to machine a pocket and hammer the part down into the pocket. Uh, as long as there's enough locating features and everything there, I think the machining forces will be light enough that a friction fit will work. I give that like a 45% chance at working, but if it doesn't work, we will find another way. So I need to figure out how long to cut this bar stock. So I'm just gonna slide this in here, give it a hand tight, and then take this piece of precision ground steel here and make a mark. So now I can take this off and measure however long that is and cut my material up into lengths that are that long. Then when I'm machining this, I will load the piece in here and line up the top with this precision ground stock every time. So I'll, I'll line it up, I'll tighten down the collet, I will machine one part, I'll remove the stock, take it to my saw, cut off the part, put, come back over here, put the, the stock back in, line it back up with the top here, and just kind of slowly keep inching the stock out until the stock doesn't hold in the collet anymore. It looks like that distance is about two and a half inches, so I'll cut this into two and a half inch chunks. I suspect I'll have to leave about half an inch of material in the collet. That leaves two inches to make parts out of, and two inches should be about 16 parts because they're about an eighth of an inch. So plenty, we, we should be fine here on material, even though this is you know not very much material. We're set up for our first op one here. There are no tools to set off. This whole program uses core tools. So it's just a matter of, well, seeing what we break. I probably would have been a little bit more confident before that job I did in the last video, but I screwed that job up so many times that uh, now I'm a little bit more gun shy. Then we have the program loaded. Let's go single block, 5% uh, rapids down here. Let's slow our feed rate down for good measure and see what happens. 12,000 RPM, coolant. Okay, I feel like we're a little bit higher above the part than we should be. Let me check my work cordon system. Ah, I originally was gonna do this on my three jaw chuck and the work cordon system is set up wrong in cam. So I need to fix my cam and then try this again. All right, we're cutting now. I still need to measure this, but it looks like it came out pretty well. I'll measure it off camera in a second here. So now we need to go on to the next step. So right now our part kind of looks like this. The actual part is up here. Imagine this is all cylinders, stack cylinders. So the part is up here and is the smallest diameter. But then when I was um, machining that, I did a larger cylinder here. And this is where, where we are going to saw cut. 
So I'm gonna come in with my saw and make a cut right there. And that'll leave me some material as a hat here that I can remove in the next operation. And then I can also keep cutting down the material this way. That seems to have worked. I dropped it. That seems to have worked and now we're left with a little button of material that's our part. I'm gonna use a combination of gauge pins and my um, digital micrometer there and get what measurements I can with it just on op one, just to make sure everything's in spec. The critical thing here is our diameter, not because it's actually that tight of a tolerance, it's plus or minus five, which is a mile on a part that, like this, but in order to pressure fit into our op two fixture, it actually needs to be fairly precise. So as long as the, I guess both the inner and the outer diameters are good, we can move on to op two. All right, results are in. We're not doing too bad, but I need to do some dialing in. The outside diameter is the one that's a problem. We are three thou oversized. That's technically within spec, but I want it to be like plus or minus one in order to do this press fit work holding. So I need to just comp the tool in, not a problem. There's also some taper in that. And so I'm gonna try to get that taper out of there, right? There's about a thou of taper. So it's two thou uh, undersized on the bottom and three thou undersized at the top. Uh, I'm gonna change up my tool path, maybe replace the tool to see if we can get rid of that taper. The inside diameter is one thou oversized, which is kind of interesting to me that the outside is undersized and the inside is oversized. I would expect those to be the opposite way. And I don't know why, like the air should be the same if it's just the diameter of the tooling. So I'll take a look at my tool paths and see if I can figure out what's causing that. But overall, I'm really happy with it. The other thing I noticed was there was a big nasty burr on one of the like crown sections. So I'm gonna add a deburring tool path to come in there and hopefully get rid of it. The next attempt with those cam changes is on the machine. Hopefully that one will come out good. So it turns out the first tool on that part broke, which then broke every other tool. So I need to set some more tools. All right, with the tools replaced, I was able to make a new one. This one is dead nuts on the ID and a thou over on the OD, actually a little bit less than a thou. Um, I may keep dialing that in just a little bit more to make sure the fit is exactly right for the press fit fixture, but we should be good to make some more of these. Actually, I spoke too soon. I wanna go ahead and make that second op fixture so that I can single piece flow these. So I'll do an op one and an op two in the same program. Every time I hit cycle start, I'll get a good part. And that way I can check them as I'm going so I don't accidentally make 20 bad ones and run out of material or whatever before I'm able to finish the job. So I wanna finish this job tonight. So we're gonna single piece flow. So I could just throw some material in my flux vise here and machine the fixture right into that material. But I was thinking about it, and I mean, what are soft jaws other than a big block of material? These ones have parts and they need to be faced off anyway, so I'm just gonna stick that sucker right there on the middle of the fixed jaw of my flux vise. Why stick material in the vise when the vise is material? Soft jaws are in progress now. This should be a pretty quick little program. So that's the fixture. Yep, that's all. It's basically just a, um, slot to press the part in and then some locating features. So I don't think it's possible to put this thing in here backwards. It is a little bit of a pain to find the right orientation. I think it's in. Uh, give it a whack with a hammer. Okay, it's in the fixture. All right, now I'm running the combined code for the first time. It's gonna do op one, and then we're gonna try out op two. It's possible something goes wrong on op two since we haven't proven that code out yet, but we should still get an op one part done regardless. I keep breaking these 1 16th inch end mills, which ironically is the big tool on the job. I, I'm not sure where I'm going wrong. I think my speeds and feeds must be a little bit too aggressive. I'm used to like a 132nd inch tool and I'm scared of those, so I'm really conservative, but I get to a 116th and I'm like, oh, this is big, I can really push it. But obviously that's uh, not working out for me. So I'm gonna go back in and dial down my speeds and feeds just a little bit more, take less of a depth of cut. Um, I was taking like a, well, I guess about a 116th inch depth of cut uh, with a 10th optimal load. And I think that's just a little bit too much for what we're doing. 
So I'm going to turn that down to just, I don't know, maybe half the depth of cut, keep the width of cut the same, and hopefully this survives. Good news is, um, this time it broke on the second op part, and the part is still there. That means the work holding, at very least, is good enough to break the tool. Which, if it wasn't clear, I see as a positive thing. I think the last thing I said in this video was that like, well, at least the work holding is good enough that it'll break a tool before it throws the part. Well, apparently that was a little bit premature because in the machine right now is a broken tool and a broken part, or a missing part. The part is gone. I have no idea where the part is. So apparently we can also throw the part still. I was really hoping this would be an easy project, but of course today is not the day. I have a new plan. Uh, it's one that I dismissed earlier and I think I dismissed it prematurely. We're gonna use soft jaws. I had previously dismissed soft jaws because I thought this gap here was too big for this small of a part, even if I used the smaller shim. But I was thinking about it last night and I went, well, there's no reason I can't use something even thinner than that. Even 20 thou should be plenty for clamping this part. So I have a couple options. I have a variety of shim stock of varying thicknesses. This is fairly thick. Um, I could even use something like a razor blade and that should give me a small enough gap um, that the part doesn't risk like falling through or anything. It'll be supported all the way, but also a large enough gap that the clamps or the vise still has enough uh, clamping range to clamp. So I'm going to make soft jaws now. Well, I'm going to make soft jaws in 20 minutes when the machine is warm. I rearranged my soft jaws so we have a nice clean face here. Uh, the part's going to go right there. I have this torque down to uh, five foot pounds, which is the minimum I can set my torque wrench to. And hopefully, hopefully this works this time. If anyone has a suggestion of a better way of making this part, I would love to hear it. Uh, the only other thing I could think of was a um, ID expansion mandrel. I've made them before. I actually have one that would probably be about the right size with some modification. Uh, but there's got to be an easier way to do this. Our teeny tiny soft jaws are done. Now I need to part off this one here and test my code. Uh-oh, we got a blinky red light. Uh, looks like a failed tool change. That's interesting, tool not clamped. We should be able to recover from this. So I'm gonna hit recover. Um, alarm exists plus yes, yes. Oh, I need to clear the alarm first apparently. All right, now recover. Okay, all done, no drop tool. Um, the air compressor was running just a second ago and I imagine that was a pressure dip that happened to pop up during a tool change. Okay, no harm done. I should be able to just resume this. I'm gonna go to 5% rapids for safety. But we should be good. Soft jaws seem to fit. We'll torque this very carefully. I think I just crushed the part. Well, that didn't work. The part is definitely bent, it's deformed. The soft jaws, I think, are also damaged. I definitely don't trust them. I have one more plan on this route. I'm gonna redesign the soft jaws. Remember, this part looks like a crown or a ring and on this fixture here, I did not have any support inside the ring. So I'm gonna redesign these soft jaws so that there is a, a little bit of a boss that the part will sit in and hopefully that'll prevent the crushing. I will also use less force when I closed it. I used my torque wrench at its lowest setting, uh, but I think even that is too much. I, I guess I just need a um, lower end torque wrench or a, a torque wrench that can measure lower amounts of torque. I, for If I'm gonna keep doing small parts like that, I think that'll be important. If you're watching me, there's a good chance you found this channel through a video where I use some teeny tiny tools. Well, the 15 thou end mill is back because that's what I'm gonna need to make the soft jaws. I am gonna do one thing a little bit differently right now. I'm about to dial in the run out. And I have learned that if I dial in the run out on a tool 
and then the tool goes into the ATC and then back into the spindle, it doesn't always maintain that same like super good run out. Now it's closer than if I didn't dial it in at all, but it's not perfect. I'm not really sure why. I think it's um, something wrong with my spindle or I, I know for a fact that the drawbar assembly on this needs some maintenance. Um, I'm hoping it's just the drawbar, like not quite pulling it up there enough or something. But what that means is to get better run out, I need to load the tool, dial in the run out, and then hit cycle start without it going in and out of the ATC. So that's what I'm going to do on this 15 thou tool because it is so small. And that added, you know, three thou of run out that I might get going into the spindle and, or out of the spindle and into the spindle could be enough to break this tool. Did I say three thou? I meant three tenths of run out that it could cause. I did clean the taper yesterday and I have seen an improvement in run out. I think I had a chip comp, uh, compacted up there. I have to say, this is the best run out I have ever gotten on any machine. Uh, I don't have an indicator that's really fine enough to show how much there is. You can't tell, but the, the spindle's moving there. Let's see, and to prove that it's not just uh, not touching the tool, I can go up and down and it's still wiggling probably a quarter of a, a tenth. All right, we have proof of life on the tiny end mill and slots where they should be. So now we can do a test fit again. All right, I've got my teeny tiny part here. I need an Allen wrench. Where's my Allen wrench? Where is my Allen wrench? Here it is. All right, let's get my little spacer out. It's only slightly scary since I used the razor blade. All right, let's see if we can get my part to fit in here. This part isn't symmetrical, but it's so close that it's hard to figure out which way goes which. Or which side goes where. Let's get this tightened down. I think we're good. All right, let's learn, run it. All right, so again, there's a little part. Can't see any details from here, which is why I can show you. But hopefully, hopefully this runs all right. All right, hopefully this doesn't break a tool because I'm almost out of these end mills. I'm optimistic though. Hey, I think we have our first complete part. I need to check to see if it's in spec, but at the very least, all the features are there. So the part is like stuck in there and I don't have a good way of getting it out without damaging it. So I'm gonna try yanking it out with hot glue. We'll see if that works. I'm gonna be honest, I didn't think that would work, but that works beautifully. I just stuck a piece of Ultem in there, which is just plastic sock I have laying around. And as soon as the glue was dry, just whoop, it came right out. We're close, but not quite good. I think the part was still sitting at a little bit of an angle. I had a hard time getting it down in the pocket and the some of the features are <laughs> a little wonky. It's definitely not shippable, um, but I think the process, how it's set up now, it needs tweaked, but I think it'll work. So I'm gonna run a bunch of these until I get the details nailed out, nailed out, nailed down, hammered out, and then I'll tell you how it went. Well, the Haas is running, I'm also running some other parts on the Torbox. Check this out. So, not exactly taking some huge cuts right now, but look at that tool. And listen to how it sounds. This is actually my own tool design for a uh, future venture that I'm working on. I'll have more in the future about that, but I just wanted to show you this tool. And the reason I'm using this tool right now is because I need something really long. And there's also some uh, slots in this middle of the part to get a, a long tool like this. So uh, it's a single fluke, ultra long reach with a uh, very stubby section of fluke. So it's very rigid for this place. This line of tools is specifically designed for people who want to use their machines in ways that they shouldn't. They are really designed with desktop machines in mind. 
but they work perfectly fine on something like the Torma. I did find the single flutes to be a little bit underwhelming on something like the Haas. Single flutes work really well on low rigidity machines, but on machines like that one that have the rigidity for more flutes, it's just slower than a two flute. So I will do some other tools in the future for you know a little bit larger machines like the Haas. Well, we're coming up at about midnight now. I haven't been able to get a good off cue off of this machine yet. Uh, these are due tomorrow. Uh, and I'm starting to run out of time on these, obviously. But I have an idea now. I I host a podcast with a buddy of mine named Harrison. The podcast is called Taps of Patience. It's here on YouTube or on any podcast player. But during that podcast, we discussed this part. And he gave me some pretty good ideas of how we could potentially fix it. I'll cover those ideas when I get to the actual like fix. In the meantime, I'm going to run all of my off ones. That's what I have been doing. I only have one or two left and then I'll be able to call it a night. And there's another job that's due tomorrow. That one has been running on the Tormach. I, I should have kept the Tormach running more than I have today, um, but it's running now at least. And the, the other parts are so simple that I shouldn't have any problem getting those done. Famous last word. So I'll see you tomorrow in like four hours. So I ended up working last night in the shop to like three, which was maybe not my wisest choice that I've ever made. If I had gone to bed at like midnight, I probably would have gotten up earlier and I certainly would have gotten up earlier and probably uh, overall gained more hours and definitely some more hours where my brain was working good. So it's about 11, 11.30 right now and I'm just getting into the shop because I, I overslept because I stayed up until three. But we got some parts to make. So I'm working on two jobs simultaneously right now. I have the Haas running the job with the teeny tiny parts and then I have the Tormach running a job that has some kind of bigger aluminum parts. For the most part, they're pretty simple, just blocks with holes. The blocks, of, out of the blocks of, with holes, out of the blocks of, with, on the Tormach job, last night I was able to get two parts completely finished. I have one part that is like 90% finished, it just needs to be flipped and decked. And that leaves me with two more parts to make. One of them is a really simple, it could basically be a one-op part if we didn't care about the finish on the backside. And then the other part is a little bit more complicated. It's still a block with holes, but it has some undercuts too. Oh, by the way, both of these need to ship today at 7. The Tormach job isn't a problem. I'll be able to knock that out without any issue um, before the end of the day. There's nothing there that is crazy or unusual. But with the Haas job, the one where I'm making the teeny tiny crowns, this one, I still don't really have a good method of making those, but I have a good idea. So I'm going to attempt that new idea, and if it works, I'll show you. For the first time ever, I'm remembering to turn off the power off at M30 setting before running my warm-up cycle. Oh, I, I did forget to power up the machine. Okay, we have the machine set up to do the little spacer that's going to go inside the crowns to keep them from crushing in my soft jaws. I'm going to do this part in one up on the machine and then I'm just going to use my saw to cut it off and just sand the back. The thickness doesn't need to be very precise, it just needs to be a precise diameter to keep the, the crown from crushing. We can probably actually watch this whole thing with the door open. I just think I turned off my uh, door safety just temporarily. So now I'm just gonna cut off this and do a test fit. Actually, I'll do a test fit and then cut it off. All right, it seems to fit. It might be a little bit undersized, but it does, I think it'll be fine. It does fit. So there's our spacer. Uh, it's very small. I'm starting to think I... So there's our spacer. It's very small. I'm starting to think I should have made it out of stainless uh, or any metal, but hopefully that'll do something. Here is our third attempt at soft jaws. Hopefully this is the one that works. 
Now, last time when I was uh, testing with this set here that's a little bit off-center, I noticed that the jaws were closing off-center. And so this time I'm going to put my very safe shim kind of just barely in the side here. There we go. Perfect. Uh, so that it closes more straightly and doesn't try to pivot like it was before. Hopefully that'll uh, make this work a little bit more reliably. But let's get a part in here and see what happens. All right, guys, keep your fingers crossed. All right, this better work because I am running out of time. I went really, really conservative on my speeds and feeds, and I started it a little bit above the, the stock just in case if my saw cut isn't even or whatever, it doesn't hit unexpected material. Well, I'll tell you how it goes. I can't believe it, but the part is still there. At first glance, it looks good. Obviously, I've gotten this far before and the part came out bad, so I'm going to inspect it. We've done it. It's good. There's a burr that I need to get rid of either in the machine or figure out how to deburr on hand by hand, but it's a good part. So 19 more of these. Guys, I got excited and now I don't remember where I put down that little insert I made. I've lost it. Found it, it was in a puddle on the floor, so now I need to clean that. This microscope is one of my favorite things in this shop. It actually gives me a really nice picture. It doesn't show up because I'm recording on a camera, but I love this thing for deburring parts. And this is how I deburred that, um, the part I just showed you. So I have this little answer here, that's a stand-in for our part. It's actually pretty accurate to what the part is, minus some threads. So I was able to just get in there with a X-Acto knife under magnification and the burr was held on just at one point. I think it was actually deburred in the machine with a, a ball mill, but like one little section of it held on. So I just kind of knocked that off with an X-Acto knife and then I was able to reach in with some teeny tiny uh, needle nose pliers and I was able to pluck it right off. So, so that burr is gone. I did, however, have a little bit of a moment of panic. So here, if we uh, zoom in a little bit, get the lens closer so we can see that here. Okay, so do you see how that hole is uh, concentric right now? Well, if you have funny lighting on here, like uh, that, it doesn't look concentric anymore. I first put the part under magnification. I went, oh no, the holes aren't concentric but it was just an optical illusion. As soon as I brought in um, some tools to actually measure that, I put it on my um, surface plate with an indicator and I even just uh, grabbed it with calipers from the side. We're, don't worry, we're concentric. We're concentric within well under a thousandth of an inch. It just, it, it looked out of round and that, that scared me, or it looked off axis and that scared me, but. We're good. So at this point, I'm just going to go into production mode. And I think, I think we have done the hard parts now. Now it's just a matter of running the machine. I've got two last Tormark, Tormach, Tor, blah, blah, blah. I've got two last Tormach parts to go. So I think I'm going to get lunch. I'm going to program those and just keep both the mills running. We should actually finish today with plenty of time. Uh, it's about 1 p.m., 2 p.m., something like that right now. FedEx closes at 7.30, or there's a farther away one that closes at 8.30. So I think for once, I'm not going to be rushing at the last minute. 